Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I am really thrilled here today to have Max Schrems with me to talk about GDPR enforcement. Max has been uh, really at the forefront of GDPR enforcement, actually making sure that it's enforced. Uh, he's brought uh, incredibly influential and important cases uh, with his name. Uh, no, the cases are known as Schrems 1 and Schrems 2. Uh, and in a great movie series, there'll be more sequels uh, to come. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a Shrems 3 and, and even more. Uh, uh, thank you, Max, for, for being here with us. I'd like to just start very quickly just to get uh, a sense of what inspired you, what, what kind of made you decide to take this on, to bring these cases, to get involved with uh, GDPR enforcement. Um, yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, I, I just have to add that, like, typically the second one is called Facebook and another, I think they just all call the trends too. So, <laughs> um, anyways, but, um, yeah, so I started, I think, to care about this whole privacy technology stuff, I guess at an earlier age, I was like already interested in computers and so on. And, um, in Austria, still that way that you know, learning to code or program is is not normal in school, which is still amazing to me. Uh, but I was lucky to basically be in a high school where you could could like get um, coding lessons and programming lessons, so that you had a bit of an idea of how these miracles actually work. And um, it's always interesting, I think, as a lawyer, to that there are so many lawyers in the field that the other way around hardly understand the facts of of all of this technology. Um, so I was a bit lucky there, um, and I think there were. A couple of things that were uh, triggering me. Um, there was already a bit of an interest in privacy, and there was the whole post 9/11 era still, where there was just more and more and more surveillance laws, and and, and that that whole um, discussion that went on. I was then actually at an exchange in in Florida as a high school exchange, and. To me, it was interesting that there was like CCTV cameras all over the schoolyard and uh, the teachers had to type in everything in a computer, you know, within two minutes if you're there or not there. And then the front office would call. So to me, it was a bit Orwellian at the time that, you know, like the teacher has another teacher that looks over the teacher, you know, and so on. So I think that was probably second time when I was a bit more uh, interested in, in, in how far that goes or, you know, that you had to like, I don't know, empty your pockets in, in, in the school and, and show what you got there. And that was to me like a bit um, disturbing, um, even though it was like countryside Florida. So I'm um, not really like a gang related place or so. Um, and yeah, and then basically I um, did more in Austria on these privacy things and law and then had another like semester off in Santa Clara University in, in Silicon Valley and did some privacy stuff there and i think that was a bit more to get interest in the, the like big us tech companies as well um because the kind of the the simple version and i'm simplifying this a lot here um is, is the message was like the europeans are kind of cute with their privacy but if you don't do if you don't follow the law not not much happens anyways and that is still true today partly interestingly yeah yeah so you brought uh, the, these cases challenging, in particular, um, you know, cross-border data transfer. Um, you know, we had uh, a few arrangements uh, with the EU to transfer data. First, Safe Harbor, uh, which you sank in in the first case. Uh, the second one was Privacy Shield, uh, and uh, now, um, you know, af after that case, uh, which uh, invalidated Shield. The latest iteration is the data privacy framework. Um, uh, they keep changing the name. Um, and I, uh, before we get into what, what you think of the framework, I guess one thing that I think was, was somewhat interesting, uh, and I wonder your take on it, is that after the, um, the European Court of Justice had invalidated SHIELD, um, it looked pretty dire for data transfer. Uh, but the thing that was weird to me uh, was it seemed like life just kept going on. Uh, companies kept doing business as usual, you know, something that seemingly uh, would have been uh, looked like a pretty major impediment um, didn't seem to matter that much. And I'm wondering what your take on that was. Um, how was it that, you know, data still flowed? Um yeah, I think in simple terms, we had a, we have multiple elements to get together there. Um, we do have a big first mover issue. So um, it's kind of an option that 
let's say the US would move and you know add some some serious oversight over um, surveillance of foreigners or at least of like allied countries if 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 that is for example a, a version of of doing this um that would be like that discussion that didn't happen because of the political deadlock and, and lots of arguments that you guys know much better than i do um then the second option would have been that the big us tech companies would basically have european um products that are fully compliant with the gdpr and separated from the american um software system so that would have allowed to potentially say they're now outside of FISA 702 which is the one big surveillance law we look into most mostly um then there would have been the option that national nationally the the customers in Europe, like the, the business customers, could gradually move away. Um, there could have been the option that basically the authorities um, start enforcement, um, and that all each one of them looked at the other one who moves first and who blinks first, and no one did. So we moved on for about two years um, of of non enforcement. That is one reality that we have. The second reality we have with the GDPR is that the legislator in this area, uh, by passing the GDPR, was very strict in enforcement. And that was the big, big promise of the GDPR, that there's going to be serious enforcement, high fines, all of that. Um, and it's interesting because it was passed with more than 90% in the European Parliament, and all the member states voted for it, um, but Austria, my home country, because uh, we thought it's not strict enough for whatever reason. Um, so it has a very strong democratic and political backing. But what it did not change is the enforcement culture. And uh, we have a situation right now where the legislative and at least the, the higher courts in Europe are actually pretty straightforward on this. Um, but the executive is simply not doing it. And so we're, I think we're even a bit of a you know, constitutional crisis moment here that um, the legislator says, you know, you need to enforce that, that you have to impose fines and so on. And then the executive simply doesn't do it. Um, the reason for that is also that each member state has its own data protection authority. They are meant to cooperate with each other, but um, they are after all political appointees. So because of the structure of the whole law, basically each member state gets to pick the regulator for its own com companies. And guess what? There is not too much interest to have to strict this regulator if, if the jurisdiction is mainly on your own companies. And that is a bit a um a situation there's other cases where the regulator wants to do the job but they don't get the funding and and so you have overall a situation where um the enforcement is actually quite weak and when it came to the data transfer specifically we're just extremely dependent on on these us tech companies um and there was just a fear of like i don't want to be the regulator that shut down service x or y or z um so they'd rather just not touch it um so i think a lot of that became very political which at least in my view, the executive should not be, that should be the place where there's a law and it's enforced after all. But that is in reality a bit different. So um, I guess we're, we're, we're five years in with, with uh, we've seen uh, GDPR enforcement and it looks like it's been ramping up. I mean, it looks like we're, we're seeing more going on. Uh, but I'm curious your, your take generally overall on GDPR enforcement. Do you think that things are going in the right direction, the wrong direction? Are the fines uh, being issued uh, sufficiently? Is it sufficiently fast uh, for enforcement or too slow? Um, do we need you know, more, uh, more cases or, or enough being brought? And what's your overall sense of you know, how effective is enforcement? Has the GDPR made a difference or enough of a difference? Mm. Um, to probably zoom out a bit, one big thing I think we have to, to, to remind ourselves of is the European Union does hardly have any executive power. So typically the European Union passes legislation, has just two courts, like basically the Court of Justice and the Court of First Instance, all the other courts is with the member states. Um, there is no kind of federal court system like in the US or something like that. It's all part of the, like all done by the member states alone. Um, and the regulators, as I mentioned before, are basically appointed by the court, by the member states as well. So it's it's a system where the Commission or the European Union can generally pass the legislation, but then the enforcement is up to the member state. And we have these issues in many other areas as well, that just member states kind of structurally do not enforce the law. Um, what is interesting here is that we have a whole culture that we would have had to change. So there was the old directives ever since 1995, where basically the same stuff was in as in the GDPR largely. Um, but it was um, oftentimes in the member states, there was no fining power, no enforcement power, all these kind of reasons. 
why the authorities have largely just not done anything. It was more of a, oh, let's write a letter, tell people how important it is, and 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 but not really do much. And this enforcement culture and also the the knowledge and the know-how that you need for enforcement, so like serious procedures, you know, cross-examination of an executive, stuff like that, they have no capacity for that or no knowledge on, on how to do that largely or are even worried to do that. They hardly ever, you know, check what's actually really on the server. It's it's largely a paper fight back and forth. Um, so this culture is, I think, just absolutely missing. Um, now, there are fines, as you mentioned, and, and they become bigger and bigger um, every year. Um, we just had one, uh, one point something billion on Meta in one of our cases. Um, so that is interesting, but these cases are extremely slow. Um, and there are structural issues again, and if they are actually going to be paid. So um, the Meta fine is the best example. That was dragged out a couple of months um, before it was actually published, just to publish it a couple of days before the five years of the GDPR. So that in the public media, you can say, hey, just three days ago, we issued this huge fine, the law is working. Um, but you have to see that, uh, at least in Ireland, there's thousands of cases per year that are brought and only about you know five to 10 fines that, that we see a year. So 99% um, of the complaints that are filed actually lead to, to nothing. Um, and that is traumatic if it's a fundamental right, because you have a fundamental right that 99% of the time you, the executive does not deliver on. Um, now, that's one part. Uh, the other part is that these um, fines are oftentimes imposed by the European Data Protection Board on the member state DPA in this case. So Ireland, usually in most of these cases, says there shouldn't be a fine, no problem, then or a very low fine. And then the EDBB usually tells them to up the fine as, as much as possible. The DPC then turns around, goes into the media and say, we issued this huge fine, which in reality is, is just a lie because it was actually uh, forced upon them. Um, and then the interesting part is that the DPC actually has to defend this fine in, in the Irish appeal system. So typically the companies then appeal um, at the current rate of inflation of 10%, you basically make 10% every year you appeal. Um, and the DPC will then have to defend the EDBB decision. And uh, best example is, is the data transfer one where, or the, the Article 61A discussion that, that we had with Meta, um, where the DPC itself went into the New York Times and said that they think the decision is wrong and should have never been passed that way. Now, that's the same authority or even the same commissioner that has to defend the same thing in the Irish High Court. And it's going to be, you know, rather simple for Facebook or for Meta, as they now called, uh, to say, um, you know, you're, you gave an interview yourself that you said this fine is actually wrong. Um, so you see how then in the appeals process, we could have an issue that the national re or regulator, again, unfortunately loses the case um, and thereby lets, lets the big tech companies off the hook. So long story short, we, we saw a lot of these um, issues already in the negotiations of the GDPR and there were discussions on, on how to solve that. And typically Ireland was always the, 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 the big discussion point. So. It was literally, but what if Ireland does that? And we see that with the system, they still get away with a lot of that. Um, the current proposal for a fix here is a procedures regulation so that below the GDPR, there should be a regulation how the authorities should work together. Again, that is very exceptional. Typically, member state authorities have jurisdiction and it ends at the border. In this case, the GDPR for one of the first times tells executive bodies in the European Union, you guys just work together. Now. That's extremely problematic, like extremely complicated, because the the um, the procedural and constitutional history of the member states is extremely different, and and also the rules are very different. So, for example, in Austria, we have a very strict procedural code for administrative procedure that sets out, you know, for example, they have to decide in six months, and and the decision has to have these elements, and the witness can only be heard in this and that way. While, for example, in Ireland, there is no procedural law. It's it's case law, as they say, but there's hardly cases. Um, so you have a, a very different approach. And um, to give you an example as well, um, Austria, for example, has a view that there should be very, very strict um, limitation of the authority, that they have only one way to decide and very limited discretion. Um, historically, that's a way that we try to kind of limit the options for the executive. Um, while in many other jurisdictions, um, like like Ireland or also partly in, in the Scandinavian countries, there is this kind of like the, the authority is right and, and they have much more discretion to do or not do stuff. Um, we also have this, this this issue, for example, in France. And and if these authorities then have to work together, um, you, you are oftentimes in a huge mess because we even have discussions of 
who is even a party to the procedure, who is not? Can you use documents? Not um, is, are the documents confidential? Can they be shared? Should they not be shared? And so on. Um, Belgium, for example, has oral hearings typically. So how are you going to do oral hearings if everybody else works on paper? And all of that is 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 really where I think the the negotiators of the GPR just stopped thinking at that point and just said, okay, let's work together. And now we see after five years of operation that that does not work that well. Um, also, if you look at the duration of procedures, so we look into five, six, seven years just for the first instance, then you have an appeal. And that usually run in, runs into Article 6 of the Convention of, of Human Rights in Europe, where um, procedures have to be decided quickly or, or within a reasonable time frame. Um, and we're typically most of these cases far outside any kind of Article 6 boundaries that, that typically the courts apply in other cases. So on the enforcement, one of the, the choices the GDPR makes is the one-stop shop system. The, the idea that, you know, a, a company, uh, you know, outside of the EU can choose, you know, what uh, country they want to regulate them. They get to choose, you know, their regulator, essentially. Uh, and uh, that's why we, we see, you know, quite a lot of big U.S. tech companies uh, choosing Ireland because uh, they think that that is a jurisdiction that's going to be more favorable to them. Uh, and then we see some tension uh, between uh, other uh, countries in the EU that, you know, are not happy with how Ireland is enforcing and Ireland, it's, it's a different philosophies. And I'm wondering, you know, does this really work or what, uh, if, and if it doesn't, what should be done uh, in lieu of a one-stop shop? Yeah, um, I think, um, so they cannot choose the jurisdiction. The jurisdiction is based on their main establishment in the European Union. And some of the companies try to just claim a main establishment somewhere, but it objectively has to be their main um, like establishment in the European Union where decisions are taken and so on. Similar concept as also in tax law and so on. Uh, so typically they still make Ireland their main establishment also factually they, um, because Ireland gives you a whole package. It's like low taxes, a court system that is so expensive that no one can ever sue you, um, like low regulation or just non-application for of the regulations. So it's not only privacy; it's usually a whole package that these jurisdictions give you. It's a bit like the you know the discussion about like Delaware in the U.S. or you know um, we have in these bigger federated systems and sometimes a pocket where um, you know the idea is let's just dump the be, you know have the rules as low as possible to attract um, everybody else. And it's kind of like you're you know, kind of abusing the reality that you're in that system on, on, on the back of everybody else. And we have similar situations with Luxembourg as well. Um, and that is a bigger issue that also plays out in the privacy bubble. Let's put it that way, I think. That's at least my personal take on it. Um, and yeah, for the one-stop shop, so the idea of the one-stop shop was because there was this distrust for Ireland um, to actually have an option to overrule them in, in the system. And as I mentioned before, that's very exceptional. We usually have in the European Union the, the principle of like um, of trust on each other. That basically we say everybody that was accepted to be part of the European Union has a proper system where everything works properly. So we do not kind of question the authority of another member state. We just assume we're all equal. Um, the one-stop shop kind of like in reality says that's not really true um, and there is these options to overrule each other but um, there is a lot of factual problems in the sense of for example the DPAs um, are meant to cooperate now if Ireland simply does not forward documents there is no place that you can sue them I mean there is you know you can send the Austrian army but but that's not gonna you know um, be the solution here um, so we, we oftentimes lack a, a European entity or a European body that can be the final arbitrator or that can be, that also has the power, the EDPD has some powers, but, but not a lot of them, um, to actually in, in, in practical terms do something if let's say a DPA simply doesn't pick up the phone, which is, is the reality. Um, and there was a lot of like, you know, trust. Um, and typically if everybody plays nicely and everybody is really trying to get stuff done, the system could work quite well. But we now see that there is really deliberate attempts to derail the system and and then there is no remedy for that or no no result for that or no option for that and again i would get back to this uh, procedure regulation that's proposed that could solve a lot of that however the uh the proposal that the european commission has put out is basically the wet dreams of the irish dpc becoming true because 
a lot of the options to interfere um, if something goes wrong are actually now cut back and limited in this new regulation, where you really have to wonder who wrote that and 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 you know who was who was behind this. Um, so we we really see that the, the process is made kind of like more paperwork, more complicated, but not actually more efficient. Um, and typical examples are that the concerned authorities, so the authorities in all the other member states, have very suddenly get very short deadlines to respond, can only respond on certain points and not on other stuff, and so on. Um, while at the same time, for example, the, the lead authority, which typically is Ireland or Luxembourg and so on, um, does not have any deadlines. They can just drag out stuff forever and just not do it, do not have to provide the full file of the case, do not have to provide all the evidence. And you see how the, the commission is right now on, on inspired by the idea of, of, kind of kind of partly doing away with the one-stop shop or having a one-stop shop light where de facto we're moving back to the lead regulator does everything. And, and that was not the deal of the GDPR. The deal of the GDPR was the one-stop shop for the companies in exchange of having the other DPAs on the table. Because it used to be that each regulator in each member state had jurisdiction over the processing that happened in, in that geography. Um, so you could actually, as the Austrian regulator, you know, rule on Facebook, even though it's an, an, an Irish company. And the idea was to have a one-stop shop, which is more efficient generally, uh, but have that trade-off. And now they're, they seem to kind of just say, okay, let's just stop the one-stop shop. Um, that's largely where this goes to, and that's highly problematic. Another problem is that the commission is now also thinking about just removing the parties. So there is a discussion mainly by France um, to say that um, the parties are, like the, the complainant is not even a party to the procedure, which is to me quite mind-blowing because it's your right to privacy. It's a fundamental right. It's like you know saying the person that exercised freedom of speech is, is not a party to a procedure on freedom of speech, and on, on his freedom of speech. Um, it's, it's quite mind-blowing, but uh, you see how this you know culture has developed uh, also among the DPAs or decision makers to just get rid of the cases, not do it, um, and, and move it away. Not all of them, again, but, but we see a certain tendency that um, you know, other DPAs probably got jealous to see, oh, the, the French just throw away most of their 16,000 complaints a year. Why don't we do that as well? That would be, you know, save a lot of time and money. Um, and that is a bit of, of, of a fight that we're having right now. And, and also for ourselves as an organization, I mean, we're based on donations. Uh, we have 20 people working here, but only six like permanent staff lawyers and usually four trainees or so. Um, our work is 90% procedure. 90% we didn't get the file. Where's the file? We didn't get the answer. Uh, you haven't delivered that. So it's it's really um, we're mainly putting energy into a system not working and not really into the material discussion of you know is that a violation of the GDPR or not. Um, it, it's mainly really um, delay, delay, delay. And 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 um, one last thing is the big tech companies also understood that. Um, so we do have a lot of cases in, in Austria, it's usually Baker McKinsey that represents the, the biggest ones. And we just have absolute crazy appeals, pages over pages over pages of pointless arguments that, uh, so we stopped ourselves to even respond to that anymore in litigation. We now have a um, attachment, one, the typical bullshit of Baker McKinsey. I mean, I think it's typical arguments of Baker McKinsey officially. And then we just list all these things because they just copy paste the same arguments over and over and over again. And that is a very, let's say, aggressive way of, of also dealing with the legal system that we see also, a bit, let's say, imported from, from maybe more of a US style um, that typically we did not see nationally that much. Like you try to be reasonable and, you know, also persuade the judge that way. Um, in a lot of the litigation, we have like Schrems too, the best example. We had, I think, 45,000 pages that, that Facebook submitted. I mean, no one in the world is, is, has read all of that. Um, and, and I think the cost was like exceeding 10 million euros in, in Ireland because the legal system is so expensive there, which basically means unless you have people that volunteer and work a lot of free extra hours and late nights, um, you're simply as a normal person not, not able to engage in this anymore. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your thoughts on uh, private litigation um, and the litigation system, you know, outside of the DPAs, because GDPR allows individuals to bring a case. Uh, but, um, you know, the EU, unlike the U.S., uh, seems to be less friendly to private litigation. Uh, in the U.S., uh, there can be big class actions, aggregate 
uh, claims uh, and and bring very very big cases uh, where there's a private right of action. And you know, courts in the U.S. have ways to uh, you know throttle that, like you know, not finding harm or standing uh, or laws that don't have a private right of action. But when they do. Uh, and when you have jurisdictions that are uh, you know, open to it, uh, you have a pretty muscular, robust uh, private litigation enforcement, which we don't seem to see in the EU under the GDPR, despite the fact that, you know, that that's a major part of GDPR enforcement. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Why is that the case that we, we aren't seeing kind of a, a, you know, a class action uh, explosion mm-hmm. in the EU for uh, GDPR? I think there's two simple answers, um, and then there's like a hundred little answers, so to say. Uh, there's first of all, you have a loser pays principle in all the member states. Um, so you really have to think: Do you have a credible case? Is that going to be upheld? And if there is no case law, as with the GDPR at the beginning, there wasn't any. Um, a lot of lawyers will tell you, you know, it's actually not a good idea to bring this case because likely, you know, you have a ninety percent chance or a fifty or sixty percent chance that your claim, which is delete my data, is going to go under, but you're going to be slapped with a legal bill of like 20 or 30,000 euros in the end. Like usually there, there is a table or a maximum that you pay the other side, but but still that these numbers can become uh, quite big. Um, and that's for most jurisdictions, let's say a couple of thousand euros, but the average guy will still not do it because you know, they will just not take the risk if, if the case law is not clear. There are certain jurisdictions and, and the big tech companies are usually there, like in Ireland, where bringing a case costs you at least 100,000 euros. Um, and there should be legal aid under EU law, but in Ireland, there's simply no office to apply for legal aid. It's like it's it's in Article 47 of the Charter that all EU member states have to provide legal aid. But, uh, you know, you can, you can, I don't know, buy Guinness, but you don't get that. Um, so you you have a you have a problem that that factually the the court systems are then sometimes not working. There's also member states where we just know the court systems are so slow that they are not efficient. Uh, typically, like in Austria, they, they they develop what they call an Italian torpedo. You basically bring a counterclaim in Italy because it, Italy takes so long to figure out that they have nothing to do with the case, but that blocks the case in Austria in the meantime. So there is there is that that these problems going on. Now, um, that being aside, we have enough jurisdictions that actually work. Um, the big issue here is that you usually have also um, no class action so far. The European Union has introduced that this summer for the first time, actually. It's a collective redress directive. It's not a class action in the US style. It's a much more mild and, and, and cautious approach. Um, it typically means that a nonprofit like, like us can bring a case, but we're not allowed to profit from the litigation at all. Um, and we have to have like an external law firm. And all of that basically means that um, you need some kind of funding for this because we would basically then have to pay the law firm to bring the case. Um, in some member states, that's doable. There is what they call procedure financing. So an external company that then actually finances the procedure. And if you win the case, for example, you get they typically get 10%. But if you lose, they cover all the costs. Also the other side's costs, which in the whole financial thinking of bringing a case, is a big factor. You always have to think about if I lose the case, who covers the bill, which in the US system, to a large extent, you can bring a case and you know, if you lose, you you just lost your time and money um, or your time and your claim, but you, you don't have to pay all the lawyers of the other side. And to be honest, I'm in favor of that system because it also makes sure that only really, you know, solid cases go ahead and not like too much speculative uh, lawsuits come up. Um, and it makes generally for society that is less, um, less litigious than 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 in the US, let's put it that way. Um, so generally, I'm in favor of it. In this case, it becomes a bit tricky uh, because there's also a question for the GDPR if you can get emotional damages. There's the first decision now by the Court of Justice saying that there is generally always emotional damages. It actually says it in the GDPR itself. Um, but many of the member states or many of the judges also are not big fans of the GDPR. They have never heard about that law. It's a complex law. So they try to find some reason to kind of pick out the case um, and make sure that uh, they don't have jurisdiction. We ran into that ourselves where you just saw judges that just try any reason why they can they can reject the case. Um, and and you see that, for example, especially the emotional damages part is a factor here that, that is seen very critically. We saw, for example, in Germany, they came up with theories that you have to have a threshold and, and all that kind of stuff. Court of Justice rejected that, but there's still a lot of that uncertainty. So it's really hard um, to build a case that is um, 
financially working um, and that is doable. Um, and then for collective redress, an additional factor is that typically if you bring all the cases combined, you would have to do that at the defendant's jurisdiction. So again, if it's Meta, Google, and so on, you oftentimes end up in Ireland and they still have like a super ancient law um, of, of um, champ champion maintenance or something as was it called, is that basically no one else is allowed to fund your case. Um, so for example, a case like that, as I mentioned, would probably cost a couple of million in Ireland, but you're not allowed to have funding, but you have to be an NGO to bring it. So you're not allowed to make money off of this. So you have to be nonprofit. That basically means you're cut out of the system. Um, there are a lot of these things are not legal. Um, a lot of these things are, are national laws that, that are not compliant with EU law. But in, in the amalgam of all these different factors, um, you didn't really get these bigger cases um, going ahead. And also I have to say the collective redress directive was only um, coming into force this summer. So we are actually waiting for some member states to still implement the national laws. Um, and there may be more in that the next years or two. Um, so we'll may see an uptick in that direction, but it's not gonna be as, as extreme as in the US um, for sure, um, for all the reasons that partly make sense, partly are, are just crazy. Well, the U.S. definitely has its its flaws. Um, you know, it, it's uh, very expensive to litigate. Uh, we don't have a, a, a loser pays. Uh, everyone pays their own costs and uh, ultimately, uh, you know, it leads to a lot of cases being brought that uh, will settle because our system is expensive uh, and takes a long time. And <laughs> they lot, they'll just settle it, even if the case doesn't have a lot of merit. So that, there's a problem there. But, but ultimately, the things you describe make it very, you know, the, the, the disincentive to litigate is, is so strong, it, it, it makes it almost impossible. And I do wonder, you know, the, the, the European Court of Justice makes a big deal about, uh, you know, judicial redress uh, and the ability to go to courts uh, in its decisions on cross-border data transfer. Yet, you know, if it's the case that in the EU, you know, member states are making it incredibly hard for people to, you know, you know, avail themselves of their, you know, litigate their GDPR rights. Um, I wonder, you know, would they, you know, could they, um, or is there any basis for them to say, hey, you know, member states have to change their system, uh, yeah. have a, you know, get rid and, of loser pays and get rid of the costs uh, and impediments. Yeah, so, so for a lot of that, I think they absolutely, these cases will go to the court of justice and these crazy things will sooner or later be declared in, in, invalid. And um, you have to think, I mean, there's about a thousand cases almost that the court of justice decides per year, but there's millions of these national laws, probably if you count them all up. Um, so they, they still have, I mean, there's much more that they do than, for example, the Supreme Court in the US, there's just much more caseload and, and decisions that go on also in very small, tiny things. Um, but you oftentimes need to, for example, get a reference to the Court of Justice. Now, it's very hard to convince, and we work on a, on a cross-European um, way, which most lawyers do not do. Most in Europe are still in absolutely only in their member state. Um, and, and you know, we have the language barrier. You oftentimes don't even know the judgments of another jurisdiction because you don't speak the language. So so there's still a very siloed approach in the in the legal bubble in the European Union. The societies merge and the societies you know travel and interact and there is a common market but the legal bubble is still very very national now um it's oftentimes really hard because of that to convince a judge that what is national what they have learned for the last 100 years is the rule of the law uh, the rule of the land um is actually something that is questionable under eu law um so it's even hard to get a judge to actually ask these questions and once they're at the court of justice uh you usually have a quite a good chance because they are kind of a let's say very liberal horizontal thing that tries to do like a middle ground in the european union and and uh, you know make sure that like crazy things in in different directions uh, get harmonized um but it is not that easy oftentimes to get a reference and to get it up there because you actually convince typically the judges of the Supreme Courts of the member states or the highest courts of the member states, that what they have, you know, set themselves for 100 years is is, is correct, may actually not be correct under EU law. That's often things, I think, uh, emotionally for, for people a big step to take. Um, and some of the things are, are would also be for up for the European Commission, because the European Commission can also sue member states if they do not follow EU law fully. Um, but the reality is that this is... Um, 
you know, they have to take priorities of, of what, what they go after and what they don't go after. So I think actually uh, for a lot of the, the points we, we're discussing right now, the collective redress directive um, is, is implemented right now. Once the laws are passed, the commission usually then goes through the national laws, checks them, and will probably send letters to a lot of the member states and say, you can't do A, B, C, this is missing in your law here and there. And that typically is then when the member states, you know, follow up and if they absolutely don't do it, then there's typically litigation in front of the court of justice. But that is a lot of that is a very diplomatic process and, and takes its time and deliberately so because the, the, the treaties, which, you know, rule and all of that, were written by the member states. <laughs> they didn't know what they put in there to make sure that the commission doesn't have too much power and that, you know, they can get away with stuff somehow. Um, so it's a bit of a, a, a complicated system. And um, it, it's, it's at the same time, quite fascinating. So I think the other way around what we did is we all got inspired a lot by like the US idea of strategic litigation of thinking, you know, where do you go? And I think there's a lot of potential on the other hand in the European Union uh, because the, the systems are so different. Uh, to give you an idea, the appeal in Austria from the Data Protection Authority is 30 euros and you can self-represent and have an online tool where I upload my, my submission and that's it. Um, and in Ireland, you need a barrister, a solicitor, and, and 100,000 bucks, and you know, all of that for exactly the same thing. So there's extreme potential in like, you know, looking for the, the right jurisdictions and the jurisdictions, on the other hand, that are more privacy friendly or more consumer friendly or just work better. Um, and, and I gave you a bit before probably the, the, the worst off, which is typically where the companies try to, to get litigation to. And, but there's a lot of potential to also look into how can we get litigation into jurisdictions that work where, you know, these and so on are reasonable. Um, and I think it's fair that, for example, there is a lose your pace principle um, because, you know, if you really, you know, bring stupid litigation, you should probably pay the price for it. I think I think that that's a fair argument. Um, but the question is then, for example, how much are, how high are these legal costs? If there are a couple of thousand euros, you can swallow that as a nonprofit. Um, if, if you end up with bills that could go into the millions, then that's the fact of killing yourself. Um, and, and there is a wide variety of of, of 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 the numbers and the options that there are yeah i guess one, one challenge with user uh, loser pays is that you know you never know what you you know what, what court you're going to draw and if the case could be dismissed i mean we have standing in the u.s i think mm -hmm. the standing doctrine is it's kind of bs uh and and cases that's, that that's are, one of the things we luckily don't have like that's you know it, it relates to each other because once uh, once, for example, you pay for shitty litigation, you don't need that much entry barriers into the courts anymore because the loser is going to pay anyway. So they will do their own entry barrier before they actually bring case. So it sometimes is, is interconnected. Some of these principles try to follow the same idea and do it in different ways. Um, and then there's ups and downs depending on, on where you are, if the one or the other principle makes more sense to you or is, is you know, more comfortable to you. <laughs> Uh, but for example, we don't have a standing doctrine, which which makes a lot, especially the privacy cases, much much easier to litigate and and bring forward. Um, we generally don't have any issues in that direction that we're actually getting rejected. It's typically more that they're like, oh, I don't have jurisdiction because I don't want to have jurisdiction. All of that also I have to explain is is actually regulated quite well in the European Union. There's the Brussels regulation that explicitly says which court has jurisdiction, which one doesn't. So it's not like the long arm statutes that go all over the place. If, in my understanding, in the US, are probably very simplified. Um, so there are rules around that. It's more that the individual judge just doesn't want to do it and deliberately decides the wrong way. We even had that uh, when it just basically rejected saying, let's see if they go to the Supreme Court and overturn my rejection. And, you know, two years later, you're back with your case and say, here we are. And you actually have to decide over it. Um, but you can also imagine how that judge is going to be happy about that situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to get your thoughts on AI. Um, you know, we have now some very prominent examples of companies uh, that are, uh, you know, scraping everything in sight off the internet. Um, you know, Clearview AI, the company that is gathering uh, billions of photos. Uh, I, I just did a webinar with uh, Kashmir Hill, a New York Times reporter who wrote about this company. Um, and these photos are being used for facial recognition. Uh, and now uh, ChatGPT, uh, its algorithm was based on, you know, a massive scrape of, you know, almost everything. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, is this something, you know, how do you enforce the GDPR here 
Um, what's your, you have any thoughts on, you know, what these companies are doing for AI and what kind of problems this could raise under the GDPR? Yeah, I mean, to be honest here, I mean, with Cleary, we actually had a bit of a, a case ourselves and there was a question if they even fall under European jurisdiction because they're based in the US and there is a market principle. So if you're in the European market, you usually fall under GDPR. Uh, but if you only sell your products to U.S. law enforcement, then the question is, are you under European market? So that was where the ZPAs came out differently. Uh, let alone the jurisdiction, usually that's that's easy to overcome in most cases. Um, the, 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 the reality that we have right now is we don't have AI cases on the table because we usually litigate stuff that in real life people use where there's an app or something and most of the AI that we find so far is more like in their PR of companies than in their real products. Um, so we will see that more the next years, definitely. Um, so we have very little experience on that. And I, can't, I don't want to talk about stuff that we don't know too much about. Um, but two, two thoughts there. I think um, from a GDPR perspective, and there is the new AI Act coming up in the European Union that I'm also not an expert on, but that's probably the place to watch. Um, the uh, Only on a GDPR side, so once there's personal data involved, um, it's, it's, I think, important to note first that the GDPR is kind of a raw data regulation. It just says, can you process data or not? But how you process it is really not very much regulated by the GDPR. There are certain elements where it does that a little bit, but largely the how you process it is up to, up, up to the free market, so to say. Um, if you think about what data goes into these systems, it's really interesting to think about that you need a legal basis for any of that. And I would have a hard time to see that that exists for a lot of the personal data. Um, there is some exemptions for research um, and research does not have to be public interest research. That can also be private interest research. Um, so there may be some room here to make an argument, but, but a lot of that is a balancing act and it's gonna be hard to balance. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is I think the output side of all of that, uh, because under the GPR data about individuals also has to be accurate. So for example, uh, someone sent me a screenshot um, showing me that, you know, if you ask what's the age of Max Schrems, it gave you something absolutely, or birth date, gave you some absolutely random date. Um, that would itself, if it typically leads to consequence, um, be an option for litigation. Um, so um, best example is also credit ranking, where if you have AI that generates, um, you know, a, a credit prediction about you that is absolutely crazy, um, you possibly have a case on that, um, which could be emotional damages. Um, but also, um, if you, my favorite example is, is to say, you know, for example, if, if your, um, if your loan becomes, let's say half a percent more expensive and you have to pay that back over 30 years, that means hundreds of like maybe hundred thousand euros you pay more just because the bank like had that additional risk factor based on the credit ranking. Um, so that could be all cases that are actually quite interesting and where, um, if AI at the quality that it has right now, that may absolutely change it is applied to personal data, you may run into a lot of potential um, issues here. Um, it's also going to be very hard to prove that it's accurate, like the result. I mean, if we have a neural network and we don't know ourselves fully how, you know, we got to the end result, how are you going to prove to court that that is actually correct result? Um, so there's a lot of these elements that will be really interesting once it becomes really applicable in a broader way. And I have to add that Lloyd, we don't do kind of policy work. We don't do kind of, you know, lobbying or anything like that. That's usually EDRIT. It's the European Digital Rights Initiative in Brussels that does that. We only litigate kind of the current law as it exists. So we don't really, we haven't done much on AI yet because it, it like on the phones of the people in real life, it doesn't exist that much yet in our experience at least. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be very interesting. And one, I think the challenge with something like JetGPT is, you know, what it, it, it's being processed in really at the behest of each user. So if I say, hey, write a bio of, of Max Schrems, I say, uh, use it to help me decide this or that. Um, uh, it, it, it could do many, many different things, but the processing isn't necessarily the, the, at the company, but the yeah. at each individual, which then makes it even more complicated because, you know, I, you know, Anyone has the prompt, it could be used for a million different things. Depending and on you're touching on a, on a very fundamental structural problem that the GDPR has. The GDPR talks about controllers and processors and data subjects and whatever, uh, but it does not talk about software vendors or software developers. And it's interesting because, I mean, if I use, I don't know, Microsoft Windows, I'm the controller for that even though I have no clue what Microsoft put into that software and what it does, um, but I'm responsible for it. And that's um, 
interesting because there is a, a situation where the responsibility at the actual power over a tool do not go together. I mean, in Austria, you still have to learn Roman law for the first year. And typically, you know, whoever owns the cow is, is responsible for the fallout of the cow and, and anything else like that. And in, in this case, it's kind of interesting because um, the software industry kind of got away quite well here uh, to say, oh, we're just, you know, we're just producing the gun in, in simple terms. Um, and, and that will become more and more of a problem where we always see that like a an SME, a small medium enterprise is suddenly the controller for some Microsoft Cloud product where they have no clue what it actually does and 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 it's it's kind of a bit absurd. Um, and that becomes probably even more of a topic when we you know we go into AI and the like. So one final question to wrap things up and that is where are you going next? Like what what <laughs> what's next to the extent you want to telegraph that? What's on your agenda for uh cases you want to bring, parts of the GDPR you want to enforce? Um yeah, what's next? Uh, too much on the agenda. Um, I think if we do bigger buckets, um, obviously we have the data transfer topic. To be honest, I'm personally not that um, enthusiastic about it anymore, but it's a, as I said, constitutional issue to really, you know, not have the commission get away by just passing laws over and over again until uh, the court of justice is basically uh, not able to follow up with all with, with invalidating it constantly all the time. Um, a little bit of an asterisk for me for a US audience in, in the European Union, it's that way that only the Court of Justice can invalidate EU law. So no local judge can ever decide on that other than the Court of Justice. So you always have to kick it back there. Um, and um, that's definitely something we're working on. Then um, the second big issue is that we try to go more into what they now call legal tech, which like every time when a lawyer does use something else than word, it's it's legal tech now apparently. Uh, but basically automating enforcement for like these typical mass violations. Like we did that for cookie banners, it worked really well. Uh, we basically got a 40% compliance rate by just sending a first email to the companies um, and a much higher compliance rate actually um, in, um, in, in kind of a spillover effect. So once we, we worked on cookie banners, we suddenly realized after the summer when we did a rescan that hundreds of companies actually complied suddenly because just they heard that there's gonna be some litigation in that. It's really, really interesting um, to, to see how that had like this domino effect. So that's the second big bucket. Uh, the third big bucket is, as we just um, mentioned, is the collective redress directive and getting ready for that and, and also applying it in the first cases. That will be for, you know, whoever brings the first case and a new law will face all the challenges, all the questions, everything. Um, so we'll have to go through that um, gradually. Um, but that is definitely kind of a, another big bucket that we're working on. And then typically the fourth one that we do is what we call um, like um, high like high importance cases or cases that are extremely interesting, where um, we usually look for, for parts where um, the GDPR is ambiguous or not clear, or there's different views, and we try to then get a very solid and, and high profile case um, as high up as possible. Typically you try to get it to the EDBB or the Court of Justice um, to, to then you know finally get cl clarity on, on some of these issues to, to see if it's yes or no. And all of these projects and all the cases that we do, you can also see on our website, we actually have a system that updates every midnight, all the 800 something cases we're right now running, where you can click through and see what we're doing there um, in different varieties. So um, if, if you're interested in these details, you can find that there. Well, we'll be following uh, along as you uh, continue on your work uh, to make sure that the GDPR is enforced, uh, uh, bringing more cases. So um, uh, I'll definitely uh, have an eye on uh, what you're doing. And I think many uh, in the U.S. and around the world will. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's been really insightful and interesting uh, chatting with you. Um, and uh, thanks again. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs> Thank you guys.